Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Business Brew. I am your host, Bill Brewster. This episode features Jordan Noon. Jordan is a very interesting guy. He co-founded Relativity Space at 22. Relativity Space is focused on 3D printing rockets. He has since moved on from Relativity. He now is a co-founder of Embedded Ventures. They are a VC firm. They focus on taking clean capital. Clean capital means like not dirty money and exclude certain countries. They are trying to help founders build companies what I would consider the right way, metrics of free cash flow and things that used to matter, and maybe now matter again. On top of that, they have a component that they're investing in U.S. security. So I think this is an interesting conversation. I know you'll like it. I enjoyed it. Thank you to Jordan for coming on the show. This episode is sponsored by Bastier Partners. New copy alert. Some of you asked me exactly how to describe what Bastier does, and here it is. Bastier Partners is a new breed of investment and merchant bank that specializes in primaries, secondaries, and co-investment opportunities in the private markets, catering to a unique coverage universe of 250 plus family offices, venture capitalists, and crossover hedge funds. While sector generalists, the firm specializes in fast-growing technology and technology-enabled businesses, advising companies on primary capital raises and creating liquidity events for founders and early investors via secondary transactions. The firm also advises fundless sponsors and GPs on co-investment opportunities. Bastier Partners was founded nearly a decade ago by Nader Afshar, a former senior investment banker at JP Morgan, and also a hell of a dude, and is headquartered in Los Angeles. Securities are offered by Hollister Associates LLC, a member of FINRA and SIPC. Bastier Partners and Hollister Associates LLC are not affiliated companies. That is what they do. Nader's a great guy. People like him. I like him. That's the pitch. As always, none of this is financial advice. All of the information contained in this program is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult your financial advisor before making investment decisions and do your own due diligence. As always, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoy the episode. Peace. Excited to be joined by Jordan No One today. An interesting, you're Jordan, what are you? You're Jordan One, you're Jordan No One, you're, I I don't know how many nicknames you go by, but another Jordan introduced us and I'm happy that he did. I'm very, uh, very happy for that as well and happy to be here. And uh, my name does get uh, a couple different variations on it. But me and the other Jordan, we're in a constant competition for who's Jordan 1 and Jordan 2. But I, I caved a couple years ago and he's Jordan 2 or Jordan 1. I'm Jordan 2. And uh, to everyone else, I'm Jordan Noon. <laughs> that too. I will. Uh, <laughs> I'll make sure that I fix that. So I'm just going to say Jordan Noon. Thrilled to be joined by Jordan Noon today. There, and we're going to start it there. How's that sound? That sounds good, and I'm thrilled to be here. All right, man. Well, it has been a while. How's your life been? Uh, you know, the public markets are crashing. I don't know if uh, if that's trickled down into your world or not, but um, it's been interesting. Yeah, it's been interesting to see. Uh, I have to say I'm not surprised, man, uh, as far as what's happening, and I think repercussions of some of what we saw in the private side of the markets. Uh, But we're early stage. We can talk about where, you know, my perspective comes from, my background, but definitely the the early stage venture industry is affected. But I think, you know, for us and our unique investment thesis, it's been different than most. And and we can dive into that. But I have to say it's a it's I'm not surprised. And we were prepping for, you know, some backlash to happen. Yeah, I I would think. um, Why don't we frame your background? Because I I, uh, my perception is at the stage that you're investing at, it's more about getting something working uh, and, and that's how you realize the value. And then sort of the later stages are where the public markets coming down could maybe hurt them a little bit more than than where you focus on. Is that fair? That's fair. And there's definitely some nuance to the early stage side and making sure those companies are you know able to be good in the public markets. It's It's something that you see a lot of the venture community forgetting. Is that you're not only building companies, um, but so many of the venture capital funds and approaches, they want to lock in multiples, flip them to the public and do a risk transfer as they grow. And it's not necessarily building a long term sustainable company. And that's something that I do find rather frustrating out of the venture community. And, And you saw that with the kind of the SPACs as the highlight of that for the last two years. 
and where this wasn't, you know, giving public investors the opportunity for growth that the private investors had. You know, this was something where there were so many companies with terrible fundamentals, no business plans, no growth strategies, you know, no good economics underneath wanting to lock in that valuation, flip it to the public, and then watch it burn. And we're all suffering from that. You know, the the public markets and what's entered the public markets, you know, in addition to to areas that are outside of companies that have SPAC and companies outside of the venture community, it highlights the worst of the venture ecosystem on kind of pump and dump style schemes. And that's something that we saw happening. You know, that's not our style of investing and building companies. So we built a variety of companies over the last two years and, you know, my background before this that are built on fundamentals. They're real companies, they're real hardware. And, you know, none of them are, you know, at a scale where I'd say they're, you know, default alive yet, you know, where they have a spot in the public markets that's reasonable, but they're on their way. And and that's something the venture ecosystem forgot about for two years. Um, So as much as we're seeing, you know, the market tumble, um, some some sides on the portfolio having you know slower ramp ups throughout this year because capital is harder to access for them, but people are looking for deals that have you know long term growth, good teams, established teams that have built companies in those sectors before, and have a reasonable chance of doing well once they're public, and that's what we invested for for two years. Um, not any of the deals that were the the hype and the um, the bubbles that you saw that have just you know gone completely crazy in the last couple of months. When you say that um, that capital is a little bit harder to access, uh, what is what does that look like in the area that you're that you're focused on? Uh, my sense is higher higher rates on some of the preferred uh, debt and or hurdle rates that you have to hit on the preferred return. But I, I'd be curious to hear how it's trickled down to what you see. For the portfolio companies, it's interesting because, you know, in the private markets, it is a marketplace, right? The more people that are looking at these companies, the more freedom they have in, you know, who they can fundraise from, like how many funds, how many family offices are looking at these early stage companies, you know, you drive up valuations. And and that's what we saw for for two years where there was an overinflation of valuations. And that's something that's really tricky in the private markets because it's something that as that demand decreases, right, there's kind of a freeze on a lot of that capital flowing today, then a a freeze or a pause, you know, I have the question of what sort of company would would unfreeze, would kind of initiate that fundraising, you know, flow again. And, And that's what I try to get those companies to look like. But it's a question there of how to fundraise when there's significantly less, you know, supply, and that tends to drive prices for these companies down. And the reason that's challenging is that it very much dilutes existing shareholders, right? These companies planned on raising a certain amount of capital. They have big teams. They have larger expenses. And so very dilutive um, or down rounds, right, where they're raising at a lower valuation or similar. And that's something that hurts everyone, right? For the founders, they have a public message out there that they're raising at you know, flat or lower valuations. For the employees, their stock options just went down. In value, if you go below your option exercise price and you're at this company because you think you can make a, you know, go from an engineer to be a, you know, multimillionaire, tens of million, you know, dollar employee off your shares, you just watched them go down and you just watched all this dilution come in then for the company. And that can really hurt employee interest because you're going to these startups for the the upside of the volatility. And, and then you just got hurt by it. That can damage the hiring ecosystem there for five years, 10 years, where people, you know, wh- why, why get options when you could get a nice cash paycheck? And, and it highlights the gambling nature of it in a way where the whole community gets hurt in these companies that have had, you know, 24 months of, you know, kind of free capital available to them. They have founders that don't know how to fundraise. They have business plans and growth that don't make sense. You know, they have no path to revenue. They don't have the skills to raise during a difficult market, and they don't even know how to think about their own company as something that needs to become, you know, good economically someday. You know, you see so many companies that have raised at valuations where, you know, they don't even have a path to revenue. They have a product and they don't know how to monetize it. You know, they raise 50 million, 100 million. You know, what's going to happen to those companies? They're they're all going to burn. Those founders are not trained to do well. And that's something that you know, to tap into my background a bit, when we started, um, you know, our first company, which is where I know the the other Jordan, Jordan number one from, 
you know, that was a very difficult fundraising market. You know, the ecosystem was very saturated in companies in the sector, and we had a very extravagant thesis on what we were doing and something that we had to win over an investment community that did not want to touch what we were doing. And that was very difficult. You were doing 3D rocket printing, correct? Yeah, the, the first company I started, it's uh, Relativity Space, 3D printing rockets and developing the world's largest metal 3D printers. And so very capital intensive, um, very interesting thesis. You know, I was 22 when we started. And so, you know, you take a sector that's dominated by SpaceX and Rocket Lab and the Virgin Group, you know, who are all thriving, you know, at the time we started, this was 2015. And you take me yeah. at 22, I think Tim was 25, you know, Tim was CEO, I was CTO. And, um, and you have this, you know, two companies in one, you know, if it's hard enough to develop a rocket, you know, launch pads, test sites, all the infrastructure, factories, the regulatory side, the, the actual tech side of that. And then you want to develop the world's largest metal 3D printers. And you spin this all into one company of these two kids who've, you know, never taken a business class before, never fundraised, never ran a company, never been managers. And you enter the market. And you say, hey, here's what we're doing. And it's something that we learned very well how to explain, you know, to the investment community, the value of what we were doing. How is it that this weird, wacky idea and these founders turn into what's potentially a, you know, multi-billion dollar sustainable, you know, market entry? And uh, over the last couple of years, it's been seven years then, you know, the company's valued at 4.2 billion now. We raised 1.3 in capital, uh, private capital. 800 people went on its way to about 1,500 this year. And I still remember the two of us in a WeWork in 2015. It seems like a very, it's, it's hard almost to connect the dots that it's the same company. Dude, that's crazy. It's, um, how do, it, I mean, how do you, how do you even get the idea? To, and the, like, there, there's, um, when I say the word hubris and what I'm about to say, I don't mean it in a rude way. I mean it in like a, in a, in an, uh, respectful and I'm in awe of the fact that you had the hubris to go out and do this. How do you guys at 22 and 25 even get an idea like this off the ground? Part of it is the naivety of not knowing better. I, I have to say that's that's a lot of, of diving into it. You don't um, you don't know the challenge you're up against. And you know you think you can kind of tackle the world. And we we went for it and we I think we were very lucky in the sense, and this is stuff that we look for in founders today, because I've transitioned, you know, from CTO of Relativity, I was uh, CTO for the first five years and stepped out of my full time role there as we hit an inflection point that I felt my skill set, you know, wasn't needed day to day anymore, that we brought on the right exec team to take the team, you know, in the company day to day through, you know, the rest of the growth. But that I loved the early stage, it's that foundational stage of the company. But it's something that through that journey, um, me and Tim knew each other as college students. I to rewind uh, how me and Tim met and the, the years up to founding Relativity together. We were at USC together, both aerospace engineers. Uh, I met him in uh, the USC Rocket Lab. And then it was a student group trying to fly a rock to space, be the first student group to fly a rock to space. Um, they came to our introduction to aerospace class, you know, first week of school. I did, I never knew I wanted to work on rockets. Um, it was something I went to, to work on planes, aviation. Um, I was a kind of an aviation buff. Then I find aviation boring now. And I mean, that's, that's not the, uh, the, the <laughs> PC thing to say. But um, it was a super exciting project where the students came in that were running the lab my freshman year. This was 2010. And they were saying... Um, we're not doing a competition. We're not flying a rocket to a, you know, a mile high with an egg in it to bring down on a parachute or seeing how far you can take a glider across a football field, you know, kind of the standard vanilla student projects out there. They're like, we want to fly the first student built and designed rocket to space. And that was super exciting. It was a self-set goal, you know, no constraints, control your destiny with it. And a bunch of students trying to do something that, that n very few countries have done. You know, there's very few people have 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 done projects that extravagant. And uh, I was actually sitting next to other Jordan during that. We went to USC together as well. We were we sat next to each other the first day of school. I remember it was uh, Aerospace 105, you know, the AME 105 course. And uh, we were both Jordans and we both, you know, ended up working on rockets together. And then, you know, we worked together at the company as well. But uh, I met Tim that week. You know, he was mentoring me. He was two years my uh, my senior. So he was a junior junior in college. And he was showing me some simulation scripts he wrote to simulate, you know, how high will the rocket go and how to optimize, you know, the propellant design and, and things like that. 
And uh, I loved the group. I basically never left. I, I, I remember my second week of school, um, the first week, you know, that Friday is when the group came through to the, um, the Aerospace 105 class. My second week of school, I had done an all-nighter building a nose cone for a Mach 4, you know, to 60,000 feet rocket we were making to fly in the desert in like 19 days. It was like a couple of weeks into school. And I did an all nighter the night before um, building the nose cone. It was a carbon fiber nose cone. You know, we laid up the carbon fiber in the mold, laid out all the epoxy, some structural components in it, cured it in an oven. We're doing all the processing of it. And this is a Mach 4 nose cone, you know, titanium nose tip on it. It's, you know, cutting edge carbon fiber. I'm like, I was 17, you know, at the time. It was a couple of weeks. This school is so and cool. And I'm making this is not what I was doing in college. <laughs> it, uh, it's amazing. It's not- it's not what I expected, it's, but I, I loved it. And I remember going to um, my history. I had a history uh, GE that morning. It was the, the discussion, you know, when you sit with like a TA and it's like 10 people in the room and I fell asleep. It's like an 8 a.m. discussion and I fell asleep and I get an email from the TA later that day. And they're like, if you're going to fall asleep, just don't come. And I responded. I said, thank you for permission. I won't be seeing you again. <laughs> and uh, not perhaps the best example of a student. And I don't think the response they were expecting, but I, you know, I actually ended up enjoying that class quite a bit. I, I didn't go to the discussions, but I enjoyed uh, the content much more than I, I can have expected on week two. Um, but no, it was something that. That's hilarious. I, Thank I ended you up... for the permission. Don't worry. I won't be there. <laughs> it's like, I didn't know that was an option. Thank you. Um, but uh, I have that email somewhere. I should pull it up. It was the beginning of my kind of inner rebellion there. But I, I ended up being kind of an odd student in the sense that I I put time into classes that I thought paid off. Classes and coursework, I, I didn't really pay attention to the grades. It was, you know, get enough by to uh, to pass. And that's something that for me, you know, there are classes that I put a huge amount of effort into that everyone else was like, these are the terrible, you know, classes, the homework's too hard, you know, it's not relevant, like you can pass if you don't do the homework. But I was like, I, this is helpful for me to learn. This is something relevant, you know, that I, I want to apply. And then certain classes that were super easy that everyone loved because they could get an easy A. I was like, this isn't worth my time. I'm not learning anything. It's, it's homework for homework's sake. It's not something where I'm learning. And I got pretty pedantic about how I spent my time. And so much of it then went to the rocket lab. You know, I ended up leading the group as a junior and senior. Uh, we flew the first two space shot attempts. Um, so up to, you know, about 350,000 feet, which is, you know, past the Von Karman line, which is the space, kind of the internationally recognized space boundary. And we flew the first two of those. And that was as a student, you know, uh, fully student built, designed. We did all the FAA work, the Bureau of Land Management work. We were doing, you know, big report dispersions on where this thing could land. Um, that was the hard part for my generation was proving the simulation, the government affairs, the regulatory work to the point that we could get permission to fly these. Because you don't want to just like shoot something up into the air and it's like, uh, yeah, you know, we'll land where it'll land, right? Uh, that could that could cause some problems. Well, it's it's a combination of where it lands and then what it flies through, right? Because if you're flying, you know, yeah. a rocket at, you know, zero to Mach 7 above the continental U.S., you know, there's planes up there. Um, you need to be careful. And that's the main thing is public safety. That's the, the role of the FAA in this. And they would not permit a bunch of, you know, 19 year old students to do this. And we had to prove out that our simulation work, the accuracy of it, the processes we have were mature enough that we would be able to safely operate this thing in the middle of, we flew them out of Black Rock Desert, Nevada. It's, it's close to where uh, the center of Black Rock City is for uh, Burning Man. Uh, it's not during Burning Man time though. And um, I remember on a, you know, the checklist side, I still have it, you know, it's a 7711-2, it's some, you know, FAA form. And it gives you the instructions for what to do to guarantee you have clear airspace. So, you know, you, this is when Black Rock Desert, you know, as much as they have cell towers now for Burning Man, there was no cell signal out there back in 2013 when the first one of these went up. And you end up on a sat phone. So it's me as a 19 year old running this group and I'm on a sat phone, you know, talking to some Iridium satellite. And, and uh, you know, step one is call Seattle Air Traffic Control. Tell them, hey, clear the airspace. And then you call Salt Lake Air Traffic Control and you clear the airspace. You know, Reno air traffic control, clear the airspace, and then Sacramento, clear the airspace. And that's the unfortunate thing about being in the middle of nowhere is that you intersect all the air traffic control zones. 
then. So you have to call all four towers and tell them, hey, like you to move some things. We need a hole here. And then you call NORAD, you know, kind of Space Force, you know, the, the reinforced bunker in the mountains in Colorado. And um, I forget what NORAD stands for, but you tell them because they know everything that's flying and making heat signatures, especially over the U.S. It's their job. And you tell them, hey, this thing's going up in Mach 7 over Nevada. Like, don't send the fighters. <laughs> and they're like, OK. <laughs> and then uh, once you get the all clear from NORAD, you know, you still have to do air and ground checks and make sure that there's nothing, you know, visually, you know, that you can see. And to make sure everyone's, you know, following the the notice to airmen and the, the air traffic rerouting and everything. Um, but then you can fly. And that's something that was a very rigorous process in, you know, for a, I was 19, you know, when we flew the first one. And, and that was kind of a, just a crazy, crazy period. But that was my foundation was, you know, balancing the formal education with the, the formal education, the areas I found valuable. Um, and I was pretty upfront with professors and sometimes they respected me for it when I told them that I found their class not worth my time, but I was going to get a passing grade. Um, that they respected my pushback and they're like, yeah, we wouldn't take this either if we were a student. <laughs> That's academia for you. And um, sometimes they'd get pretty offended. <laughs> we, would, um, we wouldn't take our class, but by the way, we're, uh, we've dedicated enough time to be tenured teaching this class, but we definitely would not take it. That is academia for you. That, it, it's academia. So I made my friends and, and enemies kind of within the, the department. Um, but at the same time, we ended up doing something, you know, that was amazing for the school. Um, you know, the first two attempts did blow up during ascent. And, but we got the regulatory work. We found out what the issues were during flight. Uh, the generation after me did a lot of ground testing, a lot of development to work through what those issues were, you know, on the ground and some subscale flights. And then they successfully flew on the fourth attempt in 2019. And I stayed mentoring and, and supporting that group just because I credit my whole career with that group. But to, to long story long answer your question of how we came to that thesis of starting relativity, part of it, I think, was the control your own destiny part of running the lab at USC. You know, that we, we controlled everything. We designed, we regulated it, we did all the simulation, we did all the manufacturing, we built machines to automate making some of the parts because we were testing and iterating so quickly that we didn't have the labor to do it. We didn't have the resources to make these things manually. So we built, uh, you know, things like a filament winder, which spins carbon fiber threads around, you know, tooling to create carbon fiber, you know, motor cases and shells. And then that went into the structure of the rocket. And, but we built that machine, you know, as students in a lab with basically no resources, but it was definitely controlling our own destiny in a way that um, I very much missed going into industry. I graduated 2014. Uh, I went to SpaceX for 18 months. Uh, Tim had graduated just before me and went to uh, Blue Origin, which is Jeff Bezos' space company based out in uh, Seattle. And uh, I was working on the crew capsule. So I worked on the Cargo Dragon capsule, uh, the crew capsule, and then the one in between those, which was the pad abort capsule, which tests the abort system for uh, guaranteeing the astronauts can stay safe during an anomaly on the, the rocket. And Tim was at Blue Origin and he was working on 3D printed components. He kind of famously now, you know, bought the first metal 3D printer at Blue Origin convinced Jeff, you know, to invest in the technology when everyone else at Blue was saying, you know, it's just art. It's not, you can't make real parts with 3D printing. It's, it was very kind of inertia limited because of that. And at SpaceX, we were 3D printing the abort engines on the crew capsule. They were the first human rated uh, 3D printed rocket engines. So we saw this amazing benefit of 3D printing at a small scale, kind of one part at a time. And then for me, and it's kind of the lucky happen chance of my career, then um, I ended up uh, getting cold feet when I was converting from an intern to full time at SpaceX and cold feet, not on signing, but cold feet huh. on signing a lease, a year long lease with a bunch of the other interns converting. So I moved back in with my parents on the other side of L.A. and I was doing the hour long commute between, uh, you know, my parents house and Hawthorne, you know, twice a day. And I as a lot of, I guess, adults learn at that phase, I was like, what do I do while driving? And I started calling my friends. And I called Tim and we kind of shared our, our exposures where we both loved the 3D printing. We saw the benefit. We saw no one else wanting to adopt it at scale. It was viewed as kind of a hobby or like an art project. And especially the metal 3D printing, which a, lo a lot of people are not familiar with is you know, you're printing actual metal, you know, high strength alloys, things like that. It's not just like plastic printing. And we saw this vision as we were talking about it, that it's not just making a slightly higher performance part 
or this unique, you know, 3D printed part that, you know, you can't make traditionally. It's, you know, we started asking the question of what if there was a company or a factory, you know, at least predominate that or dominated in 3D printing. And it's something that we saw as you get away from fixed tooling. You know, if you need to change a design, you change it in software. If you want to get feedback, you know, quality control, you know, understand what the factory is doing. It's all digital by nature. It's a digitally native process. So if you want to change something, you want to get feedback, you want to improve your process every time. You don't have to build out these extravagant QA systems, data systems, try to figure out how to get traditional manufacturing approaches to get data in and out of them. You just use a 3D printer. And even if the parts are worse, which, you know, from our perspective, they're better printed, but even if the parts are worse, the company is better. And that's something that most people, you know, 99% of the people, even in the rocket industry, will never understand relativity as a company, or at least for a long time, where we viewed it as a, you know, it moving digital automation, you know, digitization of the factory forward, you know, 100 years by 3D printing predominantly because it's a digitally native process. You have a fully digitally controlled and digital feedback factory. You're not giving work instructions to technicians. You're not giving, you know, checklists to, to QA people, quality assurance people. Then it's all done in software and all the benefits in the flywheel of software is now applied to an aerospace factory where it's dramatically, you know, dramatically needed on modernization and efficiency. And it's that iteration speed focus, the software, you know, the flywheel of software entering aerospace manufacturing that was the true thesis. And that's something we distilled down. We fundraised off of, again, you know, 99% of the people in the industry will just say, you know, 3D printing is this like extravagant hobby of ours and not see that it's a way that every time we, um, we print a part, the next one's printed better. The next one's printed faster. You know, every time, you know, a rocket goes up, a rocket gets tested, you can change in software, the design. You're not adding new work instructions to technicians. You're not retraining people. You're not changing what's on the factory floor for tooling. You're not buying things, waiting for them for six months to show up so you can install them in the factory. It's a software change. It's a code change. And you can build code to, to write that code. You can build kind of automated infrastructure on that automated infrastructure. And it's kind of the, the aerospace factory of the future. Uh, but again, very few people understand that thesis. But we got, uh, as early you know, founders, I think it's a strength, especially of Tim's. And then I learned it a lot from him in the early days of telling that story in a way where the market recognized it. And people who had never invested in space before, they got it. People who had invested in digitization of, of other industries. This wasn't like a slightly better rocket or a slightly cheaper rocket. This was bringing digitization to the aerospace industry. And that unlocked so much of the investment community that would have never touched space, never touched rockets prior. And because it wasn't just a slightly better rocket, this was, you know, moving the industry forward at least 100 years. Like you'd be appalled at what happens within an aerospace factory today than on uh, lack of automation, digitization, you know, anything software wise. It's very crude, very much, you know, hit it with a hammer style approach. But that's at the foundation there. And, and again, long story long to your answer or your question, sorry, on um, what led to the relativity thesis is that all started clicking. And we did what I think anyone would do and uh, search on the Internet for how to get venture capital. And uh, Y Combinator, uh, we'd never taken that. We'd never taken a business class, finance, legal kind of anything. Right. Uh, I know. Just I just Google. like how you said that. That was funny. It's uh, I mean, people, you know, even even for us, like even in the engineering world, anything, I'm constantly Googling things. You know, I don't I don't have an amazing memory. I know where to find things. And that's about enough. That's a, a lot of what yeah. engineering trains. You well, to that's do is... the skill you really need. Right. <laughs> You need you need to know how to how to look stuff up now more than you need to know how to remember it. Uh, I don't know if that's yeah. a good thing or a bad thing for our brains, but that is what's required in today's skill set. Yeah, it depends where. But we saw Y Combinator, the startup incubator we'd never heard of before, and we're like, sure, that sounds cool. Kind of a weird name. Uh, let's fill out this application. And uh, I remember doing that with Tim, and then uh, we emailed Mark Cuban. When, you know, when uh, Tim just did a, a release on this a couple of weeks ago, it's been floating around the press for a while, but he, you know, he named the email, you know, space is sexy 3D printing a rocket. And uh, he, you know, basically described, you know, two sentences, what we were doing, the benefit, and then uh, asked if he wanted to invest. And he ended up leading the seed round. He gave us 500,000, which in 2015 was a massive seed round. 
You know, for us and, uh, you know, and, and I compare that a little bit to draw forward to the current market, you see inv- or companies with no plans, no background, no relevance, raising $20 million seed rounds. We know we did what we did starting with 500K, you know, a little bit more from YC on top of that. And it trained us to be really diligent. We hit some milestones very early, very efficiently. Um, and then, you know, essentially, you know, to, to fast forward to the relativity journey to today, you know, we round by round, you know, fundraising round by fundraising round, de-risked the tech. We started with small printers demonstrating the process, you know, fundraise, you know, we demonstrated a big printer, you know, rocket quality parts, um, and then making our own metal 3D printers, which was part of the thesis, you know, of making the company was that no one else was going to make a printer that made the perfect rocket. You know, we had to have both in one house so you can adjust the rocket to be more printable and you can make the printer better at making rockets and meet somewhere in the middle as a business decision on, on where. Um, but we de-risked it step by step. And then uh, the company is very much on track towards flying uh, not that later uh, or not that far uh, down the road this year. What was it like having um, Mark as part of the financing stack? Was Did it did it provide a level of accountability or did he help you like like work through? It sounds to me like the group that you had together uh, from a from a financing support standpoint. Um, you know, you said that you haven't taken any business classes. It, it seems to me that they were like, okay, uh, start small, test this, or at least you work together on a plan. And um, just hearing you talk, I mean, you know, it sounds incredibly efficient uh, what y'all did. So I'm just curious, like, uh, one, how did your how did your venture group help you? And two, how does that kind of influence what you're doing now in the venture space? No, that, that's a great question. And I think it's something that we didn't, we didn't even fully realize at the time how valuable, you know, those early investors were at shaping us, but shaping us in a very balanced way. You know, one of the things and, you know, people can listen to, you know, anything me and Tim says, there's plenty of both of us on the internet. We're, we're very different people. And, but that's something that I think is very valuable in building a balanced company, right? Where relativity thesis was beyond extravagant, very much for people could be viewed as pie in the sky. You know, who are these people to have this crazy idea and make printers that have never been made before and rockets that have, you know, built with this brand new manufacturing process. But we very much balanced that. And, and me and Tim can both wear both of these hats where we can go full vision, but then down fully into the execution of it and have an idea that's sufficiently risky, that there's huge opportunity there, but sufficiently understood and, and de-risked that you can actually do it and achieve it. You know, Relativity is one of those companies that's really on that cusp where it's not, you know, it wasn't unachievable. We've proved that now. And, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't boring. It wasn't a vanilla change that couldn't get venture backing, that didn't cause a difference in the market, that didn't get recognized by customers. You know, you have to have that idea that balances very well that difference. And, um, and that's something that for me and Tim, um, we balance that very well. And for Mark and YC, you know, Mark Cuban and YC, for YC, we ended up, uh, y- YC is really good at building up companies um, very aggressively. You know, they're one of the top Silicon Valley kind of classic venture capital groups. And, um, but a lot of it is momentum, is signal, and Mark is very much foundational. And that balance is necessary, right, from your investment group. So we learned both of those and, you know, we apply both of those, I think, say, very healthily into, you know, what we do today at Embedded Ventures. And, you know, that's going to to pull forward into modern day, uh, started Relativity in 2015 and got to a size and scale that um, I didn't feel like I needed to be there day to day anymore. And I wanted to go back to the early stage um, and apply those skills on a second chapter. I didn't really know how, you know, the balance I saw between Mark and YC, the balance between, you know, everything else we did on investors we brought in over the years. And I stepped out end of 2020. One of the people that I met along the way, uh, her name's Jenna Bryant. She's my co-founder now at Embedded. Um, Embedded Ventures is the name of the fund. Um, I had known her because she was a partner at another venture capital fund here in LA. And and she had reached out to me, uh, I want to say end of 2018, beginning of 2019, reached out cold on LinkedIn and asked me if I wanted to participate in an event series bringing together venture-backed founders that had success working with the US government, which Relativity has had an amazing you know, Gov Affairs track record. And part of that too, is we saw the value as, as students of working with the US government hand in hand and healthily. You know, I was a 19 year old negotiating with the FAA and Bureau of Land Management 
And uh, very helpful to have a healthy relationship there and not what you see with so many startups of uh, scorched earth. And I kind of, you know, ask for permission later with it. So we leaned into that, had a very good track record. Jenna recognized that. And she recognized that because she um, had a portfolio company that she wanted to see delivering a solution to the U.S. government, U.S. Department of Defense. She has a personal passion there because her brother is a V-22 Osprey pilot. He's on the South, He's in the South China Sea right now. He's on the USS America there. Um, and his Osprey doesn't have access to Wi-Fi. And it's something that, you know, for, you know, someone who's in the U.S. military going across the entire world, planes have Wi-Fi. You know, there's other ways to get Wi-Fi on these things. Why doesn't it have Wi-Fi? And it was something, you know, and, and I'd have to ask her on the full specifics. You know, I think you would love a conversation with her, too. And um, but in the sense that, uh, you know, there were certain you know security restrictions, there were certain things on latency, real time performance, like guaranteed performance of the system is this aircraft that can go, you know, anywhere and everywhere in the world extremely efficiently with the, you know, the vertical takeoff and the, the roto tilt on it. And um, it couldn't guarantee good access, good security on its Wi-Fi. And she had a portfolio company that was doing gaming and latency improvements, dynamic rerouting of traffic for the gaming world to bring, you know, internet access and real time uh, network performance from, let's say, the U.S. to the Middle East so that you could get real time connectivity and play Fortnite live between someone in the U.S., and someone in the Middle East. An amazing technology, dynamic rerouting of traffic, guaranteeing performance, you know, live monitoring of all of this. And, you know, the dynamic rerouting can be extremely beneficial on a security side. Man in the middle attacks, you know, certain, you know, security loopholes where you don't want traffic going through certain, you know, intermediary locations. Directly applicable, almost even maybe a bigger opportunity than gaming, if not synergetic. But that company, they had no heritage with working with the US government. They had venture investors that had significant foreign control, and their largest contract was with Saudi Telecom, which makes it really hard to work with the U.S. government because you have so much foreign influence and concern there. So it was a technology that was relevant, that was needed, and the company accidentally built themselves and their investment and, and contracts in a way where they completely blocked themselves out from what could be a massive future revenue stream. And her question to me and what she wanted to put on during these events was how do you train these founders early on to work with the U.S. government, provide value back to this country that, you know, gives us the freedoms and liberties to create these companies, to start these companies, you know, to push back on these companies if you want to, you know, if you want to speak up against them, you can. And, but those freedoms and liberties, you know, we've, we've all lived, you know, through. And that's something that we're passionate about seeing happen. And she was very much, you know, between that passion, you know, a patriot, you know, I think we're all, we're, you know, both her and I are very much patriots in this, um, in the sense of just, you know, we've had great careers, great journeys, and it's because we have the freedoms to do so. We have the freedoms for that kind of American journey dream. And I've, I've personally had the fortune to have, you know, gone from engineer from a working class family. Then to starting a multi-billion dollar company and then a fund and then more things, you know, that are popping out of that fund. I want everyone to have that freedom. And I think that's something that that is, you know, under threat. And that's something we, we can talk about later if you'd like. But Jen and I, we, we kind of hit it off at those events. There was stuff that she saw from the venture ecosystem. You know, she was a partner um, here in L.A. at a fund um, and stuff I saw as a founder that I'd want to see different. You know, I would have wanted, you know, a, a little bit different on what the fund, the ideal fund profile that I would have wanted backing me as a 22 year old, what they were investing in, what they were willing to lean into, what the incentives were between, you know, them as shareholders and us as the operators and founders. And then similarly on the national security side, how do you bring the venture capital ecosystem out of just consumer, out of, you know, enterprise software, SaaS software? How do you get them to invest in these areas that, you know, protect the economy and the growth of everything we're doing, but, you know, are viewed as too risky or too difficult or too slow for venture investment? You know, the innovation, you know, tends to drive into other sectors. So her and I, you know, hit it off on all those areas. And when I stepped out of my full-time role at uh, Relativity, she pinged me. She said, uh, you know, I'm starting this new venture capital fund. You know, she was leaving her other fund, you know, before they they did fund two there. She wanted to, to see things sufficiently different and go out on her own. And she asked if I wanted to be an advisor. And I said, sure, that sounds like a great break while I figure out what I'm doing next. You know, help advise this venture capital fund while I uh, kind of couch surf figuring out what my life looks like for, for chapter two. And no, it ended up being something that, you know, and that was her intentional ploy. She has a recruiting background. 
then I'll talk about that momentarily, but her intentional ploy to help build the fund that I would have wanted to work for and then ask if I wanted to come on as a co-founder and, and general partner. And uh, it was a no brainer at that point. She's amazing to work with, one of the most unique people in the venture capital community that I've I've seen. And I've, I've met pretty much all of them at this point. And it's something that she comes from. She's an Auburn grad, you know, Alabama native, then uh, went to school in fashion design. She's a war eagle. Uh, and she's uh, did studied fashion design. And then moved here to L.A. to be um, a hip hop dancer and an actress. And uh, she, you know, started her career doing that and then started doing tech recruiting on the side to pay the bills. You know, it's kind of moving to Hollywood and, and entering your career there. And she needed to pay the bills. So she relied on what was viewed as a tech background. When she did fashion design, she learned CAD, you know, computer aided design for doing fashion cutouts and prints and so she learned some some what were viewed as, uh, and she laughs at it now, uh, you know, in 2010, 2011, you know, when she moved here to L.A., tech skills. So she got picked up by a tech recruiting firm recruiting for startups um, as the tech scene in L.A. here grew, you know, beginning of last decade. And then um, she loved it. You know, it was something she never had exposure to tech before. She never knew that she was really into it. She was growing up as a Girl, you know, in Alabama, you're not told you can be a scientist. You're not trained to think that you could have a future in STEM or tech. But all of a sudden, she loved it. And she started her own boutique tech recruiting firm. She worked for st top startups in L.A., you know, recruiting for equity, you know, contingent equity, where the person has to stay in the role for a year and thrive and grow and not quit and not leave um, in order for her to get those equity grants. And that's something where she learned very quickly how to find top talent in the startup community that could help grow companies, could handle the hyper growth of it, you know, people would want to work for, um, was aligned. It's not something where you just get a headhunter fee and then you walk away and it doesn't matter what happens to the candidate. And that built a skill set in her that was ideal. When you're looking for early stage founders, you, know, you have to know that community very well. You have to know how to train them to recruit. You have to help them recruit. You have to build that network up, but you also need to get you know, the skills of evaluating, is this someone who can handle growing a company? Is this someone that it's going to go to their head the moment they get a big venture check? And, you know, if things like that, where there's a, um, a challenge there in making sure that these are the right people at the early stage. And, and that got noticed by the venture capital ecosystem. And she got recruited as a partner and then decided that, you know, her, her background, the uniqueness of it, she wasn't in love with the traditional venture capital ecosystem. She wanted to see something different. And, and in doing so, she started Embedded Ventures, recruited me, and I'll pause there because I know that was a that was a long, long stint there of the transition between Relativity and Embedded. Um, but that's how I jumped from you know Relativity to Embedded was was her recruiting me in and noticing that we could build something together. That's super interesting. Um, so something that's uh, come up in background research on you has been uh, clean capital. And and raising uh, clean capital, and I'd love to hear you talk about that a little. Yeah, bit. no, ha happy to expand on that, and it's something that definitely segues from, you know, a, a couple spots. You know, the, the primary, and that falls into our day job at Embedded is, you know, we turned the background of mine and Jenna's the passion on the national security side, a little bit of us being outsiders to the community. You know, me being this USC, you know, rocket scientist gone founder, and her being, you know, Auburn. To, you know, she ended up graduating from CSUN for her fashion design degree. But you know, this fashion designer, you know, uh, from Auburn to CSUN and some hip hop dance, and she's still a, a dancer. She loves she loves dancing. She loves using you know kind of her skills there, and um, you know, and then entering the venture cap venture capital community. And we had a different approach than, you know, what most would have, but we wanted to pull in that national security focus and part of that national security focus and the theme of what uh, we were talking about with that example in Jenna's portfolio, the example from Jenna's portfolio with, uh, you know, latency issues, her brother, you know, what she wanted to see be delivered to the national security community. You know, my background on the government affairs side, what Relativity had done, and bridging all of that together, um, we ended up getting a first of its kind of partnership with the U.S. Space Force. It's something that Jenna and one of our partners at the fund, uh, Mandy Vaughn, ended up brainstorming together and then creating last year was this first of its kind partnership with the U.S. Space Force to work hand in hand in shaping what the future of some of these companies look like. And when you're in the space sector, you can't avoid having, you know, government contracts, government exposure and something very relevant to the national security startup community is um, foreign ownership concerns. You know, there's groups like CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S., 
and um, there's other groups with with similar goals. But it's really looking at you know flow of you know intellectual property control capital into making sure that these efforts that are you know at their core trying to develop a U.S. Na- national security strength or, or asset, and do we really control that? Do we really know where the information about that's going? And do we know how capital is being used, you know, uh, perhaps offensively and where it's, you know, looking at, you know, gaps in the U.S. venture community, where the U.S. venture community is so focused on short term returns, on consumer tech, on SaaS, that they leave a hole in the market where people trying to do hardware projects, people trying to do deep tech projects. And um, people trying to do national security projects, they have to turn to foreign capital because U.S. investors won't back them. And it's something that, uh, you know, whether that's an intentional strategy or not by people trying to infiltrate the national security community here in the U.S., then there's a gap and it's filled in a way that leads towards, you know, infiltration of, of ownership and difficulties in getting all of that goodwill to tech development in companies and those companies to have delivered applications to the U.S. government. And because of that foreign ownership concern, is there a hard and firm set of rules on what exactly that means? No, you know, it's not something where it's any one country, you know, any one profile. And But it's something that I think is, you know, the U.S. has become more aware of things like, you know, foreign influence in social media. Then shaping of U.S. thought, you know, uh, political divides shaped by assistance of, you know, Twitter bots. And in other ways to do that. Is that the only spot where there's foreign influence? Absolutely not. You know, you have to realize very much that the U.S. We're trained to think, you know, financially very short term and then politically on four year cycles or two. It's very short term. It's very short term. And I think, you know, what we've done in the U.S. here has been a wonderful, you know, 250 plus year experiment and are approaching 250 years. And um, experiment here. But that's something where, you know, the length of this country is less than the time scale that other countries think about. And that's something that is is very tricky. It's very tricky. And I think it's gone well historically. But I think as the U.S. has struggled, especially on a government side, to adopt certain, you know, tech ways. And then the short term thinking economically and then short term shareholder thoughts or even the divide. And, and it's the, the benefit of, you know, capitalism and democracy is that we have the choices of where we build companies and what we work on. But if you think about, let's say, strategic development of the CCP in China, every company there is a dual use tech company. They're mandated to be dual use tech companies. There's no divide on what is government tech and what is commercial tech. And, and when you have direct control you control where the strategic innovation is. When you have a democracy and, and capitalism, what we have, you know, going, uh, 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 you know, capitalism and democracy as we have here, you have to incentivize people to develop national security tech. You know, right now the people working on it, it's people that have the passion or they have, a, you know, perhaps a growing anxiety or fear in them of, you know, what the country is going to look like in 20 years or the global kind of power map is going to look like in 20 years, 30 years, five years. You know, it may be much shorter than that. But the challenge we have that is a real, real challenge, and I don't have an answer, and I don't think anyone you talk to, you know, at any level in this country will have an answer on how do you encourage strategic innovation in this country through capitalism that matches the direct control of our competition? Because we essentially have to get the public and the business owners and the founders to want to develop to strengthen the country on a national security side more than a country where they can directly control where every single person's work goes, where every single company's tech goes, and what they're all working on. It's an extremely difficult challenge, and that's where the breakdown is really happening in my mind, which is, you know, we're just so focused short-term, so focused on consumer, is how do you compete? How do you compete on a decades-long or 100-year-long timescale? And if you read, you know, documentation that the CCP publishes, you know, their plans, their five-year plans, their 50-year plans. It's completely over-dominate the U.S. and build the infrastructure to completely tank our economy, you know, divide us politically, and then and develop the technology that we either just fall apart because of the, the infrastructure around us falling apart, or we're slowly just bought out and owned by not ourselves. You know, you see artwork coming out 
from there of uh, there's a, a I, I don't want to call it famous. I, I view it as infamous. I wish it was almost more widespread out of the awareness it would cause in the U.S. A piece of artwork of what it would look like for a CCP owned like Times Square where you, the U.S. just slowly migrates into being like a subsidiary or, a, you know, an outside country for um, for China. And, you know, kind of an acquisition there. And that's something that, you know, we're trained to think the U.S. is inevitable on continuing. Um, we're trained to think that we don't even have to think far ahead strategically because we're so good and so powerful. Um, but I think a lot of that is going to be tested. It's already being tested. This decade is proving that out. And then on testing, can the U.S. on an infrastructure and power side stay ahead? And, you know, I want someone to tell me why they think the U.S. is developing strategically enough to stay ahead. Because I've been in that community for 12 years now. I can say from my perspective, they're not. So how do you use uh, your influence and your position at uh, your firm in in order to incentivize uh, the outcomes that you're looking to achieve while also competing against, you know, a, a VC firm that's in, a, in the same vintage that maybe just like sprays a bunch of bets on consumer tech that really doesn't actually matter. But boy, the IRR is great, right? Like, how do you how do you um, balance that tension? I'd say... Well, the first part I'll push back on briefly is that the spray and pray IRR returns of consumer, it was great. It's not anymore, right? And I think the the markets realize that into some of the parts I highlighted on the relativity story and the diligence of being lean, building a good company, understanding how to fundraise, understanding what you're doing in general and how it kind of fits in the market and learning how to fundraise when it's hard is something that there's unfortunately about two years of founders you know, like last 24 months of companies, the capital was free. They didn't learn to fundraise. They learned to take checks, but that's very different than fundraising, especially during a downturn. And uh, they have no strategic plans on how their company fits into the market. Some of them don't even have monetization plans. You hear of companies that got $50 million checks from top tier VC funds. And then, you know, I, I talked to some of the founders. I'm like, oh, how do you guys make money? And they're like, we don't have plans for that yet. They, they 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 don't they don't What's have a money? They don't, what what is this thing yeah, it's you like speak how do you of? monetize your product our, our plan is to yeah, raise no, more it's like how do you monetize your product and they're like we don't that's not needed we'll just keep fundraising and, and it's incredible but they're trained to think that that's normal and that's really gonna hurt it's already hurting you you see the horror stories you see the layoffs you you it's gonna be very bad this year on what the outlook for the last twenty four months of most startups look like and and a lot of our goal is a fund was to show that you can make money and good returns, kind of do good and do well, while having a thesis like ours. It does involve diligence. You know, sometimes we can invest extremely quickly, you know, if stars are aligned on our understanding of a company. And sometimes it takes a while. And that's something that we missed out on deals. We missed out on founders uh, during the last 24 months. You know, it's, we're approaching maybe 18 months of running embedded, close to 18. And there were founders, very good potential, very good backgrounds. And they had investors on their cap table that told them that if there were other investors, new investors that had questions, they wanted to ask questions before investing. They were too difficult to work with and to pass on them. And that's something that, you know, us wanting to do diligence, uh, even ask some questions, even light diligence, they were saying, no, we can take checks without answering questions. Why should we work with you? And, and maybe that was my, you know, uh, my hubris there being offended, where I was like, you're, you're passing on us. And, and what value does anyone else bring to you? I'm like, we at least try. Everyone has their value add as kind of a, you know, sometimes running meme then of the venture industry of, you know, the quote unquote value add. Uh, but I think we, you know, we, we've grown some companies in the sector and we're the only, you know, partnership that gives briefings to the four stars at the Pentagon out of the entire venture community. Everyone else hires lobbyists. We have an open door relationship at the Pentagon for briefing on how we think this is going to play out. And you're passing on us, you know, in this sector. And uh, that happened. Like, and I, I would sometimes tell them, like, we used to have to fly places to fundraise. It wasn't just phone calls. You know, you would fly to get a 20K check, you know, to get the right investor on your capital. Yeah, they didn't just come yeah. on Zoom. And they're saying that the Zoom is too yeah, much. Yeah, that's nuts. I've had founders I've talked to and, and bless their path through the current market that said um, they didn't have time for Zooms. 
I'm like, what else are you doing? Like, you know, I, I mean, maybe That's you're crazy. heads down building a company, which is fantastic. But uh, I heard you're fundraising. And they're like, yeah, we are. Whoever commits, you know, will take their check. <laughs> but no phone calls. And uh, it, it was a pretty incredible market for two years. But, you know, we have a, you know, we deployed 10 million last year as, as embedded. And then six portfolio companies. We did three of them follow on. So we did nine deals last year. And, um, and that's something that uh, of those companies, you know, that 10 million is, is increasing in, in, you know, this year, as far as what we have under management, increasing pretty significantly. But it's something that, you know, we were very patient on some of those deals. And for all of them, you know, I think of the six companies, you know, and we spent a while this year heads down with them just to make sure that they were very solid going into the current market. And, you know, five of them, I'd say no problem, no change in plans. You know, one of them is going to be raising at a 3x instead of a 5x in, you know, eight months. I'll take it. You know, I'll I'll, uh, I'll, I'll hold myself back from complaining that uh, the, uh, and it was a company we wrote the first check in them. So it's a 3x on the follow on check. It's like a, you know, 16x on the original check, you know, from 18 months ago. So I'll take the double digit multiples on the early checks and the, you know, high single digits, mid single digits on the, the later stage checks uh, without complaining. And that's something that as far as how to build that community up and um, and how to show the venture ecosystem, I'm hoping and, and we've actually seen quite a bit of this through the downturn um, the last couple months is that everyone's scared. You know, no one's deploying capital. A lot of people have capital committed. You know, these funds raise massive funds. You know, everything's committed and locked in. Um, just everyone's afraid to spend. They don't know what's going to be good. They don't know what the market's doing. But it's something for us. Aerospace doesn't deal with downturns. You know, aerospace, you know, communications, imagery, you know, satellite launch, everything happening in space and how that affects certain industries on the ground. You know, that's still active. You know, aerospace is a very robust market, at least the space side. You know, aviation can be a little troubled and clearly was during COVID. But other than that, you know, it's a pretty robust market. You know, the national security side, the government side, everyone who relies on that data, it's very robust. And then the companies we worked with, you know, I think each of them could easily be at scale, a good public multi-billion dollar company. They're not ones that we look at as ones that are just there because they're hypable. They're because, you know, you can bring in the right co-investors that bring in the right follow-on investors that give the right signal that you get a pre-IPO investor to push them over the hump. And then go public and then you wash and burn, right? You know, it's something that, you know, if we had to, and, you know, for our, our deals, we do have, you know, exit timelines on them. But if we had to hold them in the public markets well after the IPO, I think they would be good companies and I wouldn't be afraid of holding them. And that's something where, you know, the way that I've seen it happen is, you know, everyone talked about like, you know, K-shaped recovery post COVID, you know, money started printing, Rates started going down. People were finding creative ways to deploy that. The SPAC market went crazy and wonky. And, um, and you saw people that had massive access to capital historically kind of doubling down, you know, certain mega funds, you know, deploying and deploying and raising and raising. And then for the early stage, you know, early fund managers, you know, us included, it was like, why work with us when everyone else can generate, you know, 500% returns year over year right now? And you know, like, why find a new fund manager? And that was a little frustrating, but you know, understandable. First time fund managers, it's always a very uphill battle on, on fundraising, especially with institutions. But it's something that that K-shaped recovery, what I'd view there of you know, the, a divide of those with access to capital, you know, doubling down on deployment and those that had you know, significantly less, you know, having less opportunity. I think for us as early stage fund managers, you know, and we're going on, you know, we've, we've been at this a couple of years now and have quite the track record now on fund one and in what we've deployed to date, that I see that K inverting in various ways where you see people that had access to capital, they're, they're afraid to spend it. You know, there was a, a friend of mine, uh, they just raised a billion dollar fund. They have a big space investment in their first portfolio. They raised this on this thesis that they could have fun too, have the same thesis, these same kind of space wins. And I got a call from them the other day and they're saying, we have no idea how to deploy this. All of our LPs are looking at us as this investor that can navigate, you know, this deep tech market and, and we're not qualified to do that. And it's been surprising because even those same institutions and banks that would, uh, you know, we'd be trying to do everything we can to win them over last year, get their attention in any way, give them free help, free diligence help, you know, advice on companies. You see them all turning around right now and saying, hey, I know we, you know, it was great meeting you last year and then, you know, kind of dragging our feet for six months. 
on, on seeing if it made sense to work together. Now they're saying, hey, can you help us on all these companies? And we're like, why? And they're saying, you know, their, their portfolio is struggling. They need to deploy the rest of it in good companies before anyone notices that the first half of the deployment is about to go to zero. And you see that a lot across a lot of funds into the spray and pray. They, they need to deploy and get double the multiples on their second half of their deployment in less time because their first half just completely tanked and, and kind of catch up before anyone notices. And, you know, they're coming to us and saying, you know, hey, your portfolio, none of them are struggling. You guys actually diligence them. You guys have reasons to think now that they can get follow on investment. They're like, can we work with you? And then we can say, hey, we only work with people who back our funds. And, you know, it drives attention our way. And we do have limited time and we have a portfolio to grow. And uh, the free help from us is is gone Then because of that. But that's that K inverting in various ways where the market, and this is a question I asked, I think I mentioned at the beginning, like the market is looking for deals that will unlock the market, right? No one wants to be sitting on idle cash right now, idle commitments. They need to be accruing multiples and, and gains on these for them to have any level of fund level metrics by the, the time these funds, you know, are at end of life. You know, they can't be sitting forever, especially after the first, you know, chunk of that just went to zero. And that's something where they look to us. And that's something I found very flattering from the LP base and, you know, the limited partner base and from, you know, people who have kept an eye on us since we stepped out to, you know, run a fund together, you know, two years ago, which is them recognizing that, hey, you know, maybe we didn't make sense, you know, during the craziness of 2020 and 2021. But in a 2022 market where you need good companies that have legitimate reasons why they can grow, you know, founders, operator experience, then people who have built companies in very difficult sectors before that can, you know, especially for us, we can be a first check in a company because the founders relate to us. You know, if you're a 22 year old founder, you know, with a cool idea, you know, you can Google, you know, how to get venture investment. You know, and at the time, you know, the top two things that came up was, you know, venture, you know, YC and, and Mark Cuban. And, you know, that was our story. But now if you're a space startup and you're looking for like, you know, space startup founders to learn from, you know, they sometimes stumble upon me, you know, not always. But they're like, hey, Jordan never took a business class. He started a multi-billion dollar space company, you know, as a 22 year old you know, sometimes good head on his shoulders. I don't want to pat myself on the back too much with this, but that, you know, I, I, I'm willing to talk to these people because I relate to them. That's my community. Those are my people. And then as those kind of engineers, and I, and I love that community and, you know, between the USC work, the SpaceX work, like I, I am that engineer gone founder and they notice I have that investor title now. So they ping me and we can get into deals, you know, during formation of these companies when they're still solidifying their idea, but in a way where we see, you know, the glimmer of, you know, stars aligned as market timing, them being able to make something in that sector where, you know, no one else will invest in it today. And in five years, they're going to look perfectly timed. You know, some big government contract, some change in the space market. You know, we have to invest off a thesis we find highly defensible, able to win over significant market share. You know, we don't just invest in space companies because, you know, they're space companies. Like they have to be very good investments. But I do think all of them are good companies. And it's something that they come to us very early. So we become first checks in these companies, these sectors that maybe are very young today or maturing and growing, but sectors where it takes someone really in that community on tech development, on risk, on talent, on the government affairs, on, you know, just even the, the experience of building a company like that before in the space sector, because relativity is kind of a degree removed from what most of the portfolio does today. That ends up being very robust for building a thesis between kind of general partner thesis fit a portfolio that's growing, you know, me and Jenna very much complement each other in ability to grow the companies, recognize the talent, recognize the risks, um, help them grow and recognize them. And it's something that us as these kind of two very unique general partners that uh, had never managed a fund before, um, us being slow, patient and diligencing these companies in a market that didn't want to be diligenced, didn't need to be diligenced. Um, that will be very much recognized now. And that is to, you know, to wrap that up, it, it's, it's in pro. I might argue that the market needed to be diligenced, but didn't want to be diligenced or it needed it, but it didn't need it. If yeah, you dig what they, I'm they saying. They got what they were asking for. It, it, and, and you can see hints and stuff yes. I've commented on for, for years, as far as, you know, there being no reason to expect that any of that capital being deployed ever generated returns or the majority of it. I'll tell you the thing that makes me nervous, man, is we're going into a period, and I, we're in the period, of decreased liquidity, 
And like all of that, all that just like money that was thrown at stuff that wasn't worth anything that did employ some people, whether or not those were jobs that should have been jobs is sort of a different question. Right. But like, I don't know, it does make me a little nervous about the recession that is probably going to come in the not too distant future. But, you know, those are big thoughts that I, beyond my the, pay the combination of inflation, haphazard capital deployment, uh, it's not over yet you know, is, is probably what I'll say. And, you know, what does that mean for us? You know, I, I can't predict the future with it. And, but I can definitely say everything we were feeling and seeing for years, like most of the funds that are going to have massive markdowns, public and private, those have not been realized yet. Or those fund managers are waiting to see some level of, you know, delaying those, working through those for a quarter or two while they try to rebuild positions and something growing. And, and there are things, you know, you, you do see even in the public markets, people seeing how cheap things are right now. Then certain companies make no sense in the public markets as far as being too low on just, you know, traditional like earnings ratios. And you see people almost taking advantage of the volatility of the public markets, something that never should have happened. Right, the public markets to hold on to that capital, wait for the market to completely tank, and they're going to make great returns too. But they're working off the volatility on the public side instead of the private. But I think people will learn to redeploy in good companies. You know, those good companies will do well regardless. That's why they're good companies there. And you, you'll see that resurgence. But I do think the the decay of that and people desperate to find good deals right now then to get into and with the help, you know, perhaps of people like us and, and our portfolio, it's going to be pretty rough on the ones that don't because those, you know, those double digit multiples are going to call turn into, you know, high double digit percent losses. And it's very scary. You, you see reports of some of that. Everyone who's like a, a public fund, you know, with markdowns or some of the like pre IPO funds out there, there's news and you, you can read about them. I'm not going to give names. Then of funds that have lost majority of their gains for decades are gone and erased in months. You know, that's that's going to have a backlash for a very long time. And you're going to see a massive transition in who's managing that capital. I mean, I think it was a scare that was necessary, but it's a scare that's unfortunate because even in the space market, you saw so many space companies SPAC over the last year that were the yeah. premier examples in the market of bad fundamentals of you know incentive structures that made no sense on on sponsor pay payouts on you know investor payouts getting these things to flip into the public markets and then what happens you know during that is not only it flips the risk to the public investors but it shows how hard it is to build companies in these sectors so for us you know and how we look at what to, how to shore up the current portfolio those growth investors could be spooked for a decade and everything we talk about on national security on investment, like our goal as a fund, you know, not only is to support national security, but on a on a meta level for this, it's get the venture ecosystem as a whole to see that this sector is one you can make good money in. Because I want, you know, people investing in the sector and to talk about, you know, at a high level of that capitalism incentive structure again. I want people investing because they see the dollar signs, not because they're a passion investor or a sector investor, because we need that as a country for us to get through this century. We need that national security investment and we're not going to get it, you know, if if people are seeing extremely bad companies with extremely bad returns is the majority of what's coming out of the sector, you know, the, the, the market tanking and the space yeah. companies. Yeah, it taints the sector. Yeah, the, the, right? the sector is tainted, even though it should not. But it, it, it is. And that's something that we're all going to feel the aftermath of um, as we grow these companies. But it'll highlight the ones that are good. And that's kind of the challenge for the next couple of years. Yeah. But I completely agree with you that uh, I think the worst is yet to come. Like, I think there's no reason to think this is the worst of it on um, kind of the capital markets freezing up and people being spooked at the aftermath of the last couple of years. Yeah, well, the spacking and selling of pixie dust <laughs> pissed me off when it was happening and continues to. Uh, but, you know, I I think that there is always going to be a world where a true growth investor that is looking to buy a, a real business that generates real returns that will grow. I don't think those investors are gone. I think the investors that are gone are the uh, people that probably were were uh, riding liquidity waves and called it investing, yeah. right? Th those people have figured out real quick what they owned, and it's uh, not much. That's correct, and it's I, I sometimes don't know. You know, as much as we have, you know, venture, you know, we're a venture capital fund, 
the venture community and their style of, you know, power law returns and kind of crazy, wacky styles of the, you'd phrase it as a, I think you would phrase it as this, as the spray and pray investing. And, um, you know, yeah. I, I, we're venture capitalists, like we run a venture capital fund and it's early stage, but it's something where, you know, we're trying to find a unique spot in the market where we can not only be helpful, but we can recognize a, an opportunity that is undervalued because the rest of the market can't recognize it that early. And we're trying to use our, our skill set. And, and this is where I think we've thrived is our skill set to recognize the very faint signals coming out of the founders, the company, our understanding of the market, the U.S. government relationships, everything we have to see where that opportunity is at a lower price than someone else. would. And that's something that, you know, there, there's elements of that align well with, you know, growth investing. You know, it's recognizing an opportunity that's undervalued and going to get recognized eventually and correct itself. And, but it's something that, you know, you, you read certain books on, you know, top GPs at top Silicon Valley funds and their rules for investing is like, you know, the company is 300% year over year growth. They're in Silicon Valley. So they have, you know, uh, a good community around them. They have top co-investors that are willing to pay any price because, you know, they also recognize the hype of it. And do you then just distribute your checks small enough that hope that you hope one of those checks will, um, you know, get a thousand X. And I hear that and it's it's absurd because it's what level of that involves any any skill. Some of it's access, you know, some of it's, you know, having a very high profile where people want to reach out to you. But none of that is building good companies. None of that is recognizing value. They're using, you know, kind of, you know, a lagging indicators of of short term growth instead of looking at is can this company, you know, create a defensible long term good company. And the indicators, you know, whether it's founders, the market, the approach, you know, it's not short term revenue at 300 percent year over year. If that is your signal of a company that's, you know, uh, 12 months old and they went from, you know, a thousand, you know, ARR, thousand dollars ARR to, you know, three thousand ARR. And that's what you think means they're going to be a billion dollar company that's defensible in a bad market. That's a terrible thesis. And it, it amazes me and it makes me at times really want to not be called a venture capitalist. You know, we're investors. <laughs> ah, dude, it's not just venture capital, man. That stuff got popular in public markets too. this valuation agnostic founder worship stuff. To be fair, I think there's a grain of truth in some of it. And uh, I used to have my brain turned off to that grain of truth. And I don't think that I have it turned off now. However... Uh, this is kind of a macro comment, but I don't think that that's the strategy to run in a tightening liquidity market. I think it is the strategy to potentially run early in a expanding liquidity market. Uh, but I think it's riding a liquidity wave more than yeah. true fundamental analysis. I, I agree with that. And for us, you know, I don't want to call it fundamental analysis because we're, we're too early for that. There's there's a different set of you know what I'd call fundamentals there. But it's something that I think, you know, and it is the challenge in the investment market is being patient even while capital is flowing aggressively. Uh, and, and that it, it's it's very hard. There, there were deals that I would have loved to do instantly because, you know, I get excited about something. And then, you know, well, one's why we have a team to, you know, keep me contained and, you know, our, our impulses contained on, on investment committee. But we have our process and we run it and we we don't violate that. And if it's too slow, it's too slow. But we even did, and, and one last thing I'll, I'll add in as a fund, you know, and, and what I'm up to now day to day, as well as that we, um, our investment thesis, uh, in addition to the dual use tech side, it's space technology beyond launch. And I don't know if I said that explicitly, you know, prior, um, but we split that in three areas. It's space operations. So kind of what I'd call usual suspects of things happening in space, like communications, imagery, you know, newer areas like um uh, lunar infrastructure, manufacturing in space, power generation in space, you know, all, human transport, but we, we haven't done anything there yet. But then a third of it's advanced manufacturing. That's just my relativity roots saying, you know, that the tools that these companies use and are very useful for terrestrial, you know, any earth application as well. Um, tr advanced manufacturing, very relevant for seeing that portfolio grow and balancing it. And then the last third is digital engineering. So it's the software tools that support hardware design and the hardware ecosystem. It's a very nascent sector. You know, I'd say there's been maybe one example of a, a company that was bought at a decent valuation. They, they didn't go public. They were bought and, and merged. Um, that's happened in the last 20 years in software tools for hardware designers. And you see these hardware projects getting much more complex, much more globally integrated on supply chain, on manufacturing. And they're using software that had basis and roots in the 80s. 
maybe the 70s. I've been dramatically surprised by it. Relativity was a great example of seeing what the tools were out there outside of the 3D printer and factory stack, you know, that are on the design floor. You know, what do the designers use? How do the systems engineers, how do you design these programs? How do you manage these programs in a way where you understand this complex project that couldn't be that complicated 40 years ago? You know, uses manufacturing techniques that weren't available 40 years ago. And we built a thesis around what we thought would be a portfolio winner in the digital engineering space. And we couldn't find it. Kind of long, long story short with it, I didn't talk about it much, you know, on the rest of this call, but we ended up spinning that company out, hiring on a founding team. And now I do run the company day to day as CEO. And so I split my time half general partner, half as CEO. But it's something for us, and we're a little kind of restless with this stuff, is that if we see a gap in the market and no one's filling it, you know, we'll go fill it. Uh, that's one of the highest perform or highest performing uh, portfolio companies right now. On a return side, is that we did the first check. We hired on the founding team. We have a day to day operational role in the company, in addition to supporting the rest of the portfolio. We don't have a name for what that is. You know, as far as is that a uh, you know a venture studio? Is that a hybrid venture studio? We don't have a name for it other than uh, we saw a hole in the market. We had the right team that we could bring on to fill it, and we did. And that's just another tool in the toolkit we have. That's awesome. Go, go ahead. Yeah, I mean that's that's cool, man. I uh, sorry, my dog is barking in the back. Uh, that I mean that's awesome, and I I um, I, I'm really glad we got hooked up. I thank you very much for coming on the show. I hope you'll come back and give us updates as uh, things go along. But I, uh, you know, uh, my thought as we've been having this conversation is. What a potential opportunity you all have uh, with your with your background and understanding how to raise capital in a lean environment and and you know the the potential value add that you could bring founders because I think that's going to be a skill set uh, where the market demands like very real companies on a go forward basis. So I'm I'm very excited to see what happens in your future and uh, I'm I'm very thankful that you stopped by. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. This was very fun. Mm-hmm.